Hey folks, welcome to the recorded version of Advanced Marketing Guide to Online Retail 2015. This was originally aired with a live audience on the 14th of January 2015. I'm your presenter. My name is Nick Rochball. I'm the VP of Client Services here at Exclusive Concepts. Um, if you ask for an audit or if you've asked for an audit, either for PPC or SEO or to talk about the holistic approach to your marketing, I'll be the person who you meet with. I look forward to it. Uh, this image down here, let's zoom in. This is an image of uh, my father's gas station slash convenience store. Um, and I, I want to share this because this is actually my my exclusive concept story, why, why I'm here at Exclusive. Um, back in 92, my dad got laid off uh, along with a lot of people in, in Rochester. It was a tough time. At that point, a couple of his friends and him um, started and um, purchased this uh, convenience store gas station. My dad was doing all the grunt work, so he ended up uh, buying the gas station from his partners. And my father and I um, contributed towards um, the work. My dad did all the grunt work, but uh, on the accounting side, he asked for my help. And I was only 13 at the time. I was. Um, I was doing all the accounting daily, weekly, monthly, annual. Um, it helped a lot, but it was a 24 hour convenience store. Um, it was really tough to run. Uh, the toll was uh, so high. My mom is still sick because of uh, how tough it was on them and sleeplessness, et cetera. Um, but that's why I do what I do. Um, it's, it's my father that I see when I speak with people I've never spoken with or speaking with clients. Um, I remember my dad's struggles and I'm trying to do what I can to make things easier. That's what drew me here and everyone here at this company is drawn here for one reason or another. This just happens to be mine and it's interesting, you know, Scott Smigler, our president, he started uh, in retail because of his father who owned a very successful retail chain in New Jersey called Surrey Luggage. Uh, our VP of Operations, Sheila McNenny, uh, started in retail and small business because of her father. So when we started this presentation on the 14th, I asked the group uh, a quick poll. How many of you were influenced by a parent to get into retail? And it was uh, probably no surprise, but it was nice to see 32% uh, of the people watching had gotten into retail because of a parent. There were some other stories that were shared at the same time in the chat window of how, how hard it was to do brick and mortar versus e-commerce, or e even how challenging e-commerce has been. Um, it was a nice nice time for us, uh, for us to all kind of get things out and, and talk about the emotional connection that we have to our businesses. Um, let me take a step back, talk about exclusive concepts really quickly, and this is all we're gonna talk about exclusive. We were established in 1997 by our president, Scott Smigler. We've been on Inc. 5000 every year since 2008. Um, so we've been growing very steady. We have five core services, SEO, PPC, Google Shopping, conversion testing, and email marketing. Um, we have 200 plus clients and they're on an array of uh, different services. What we try to aim for is the best performance and we try to achieve the best performance by focusing on profit and building philosophies and technology and processes around achieving best performance, and that helps a lot. Um, we also try to take as much off our clients' hands as possible so they don't have to do the work. If we're coming up with the philosophies, we should be able to do the work. So it's as full service as possible. Um, we have over 90 employees right now, and we are headquartered in... Um, the greater Boston area, Burlington, Massachusetts. So quick agenda. I'm gonna do a quick holiday recap. We're gonna do uh, a recap of 2014. We had eight webinars in 2014. We're gonna do a quick uh, three point checklist to essentially round up everything that you should have learned in 2014. It's, it's quick, but very helpful. We're gonna talk about 2015 trends of success. What are our most successful clients doing that are separating them and making them more successful in 2015? We're gonna talk about holistic marketing and what that means for you. 
Then we're going to work our way backwards in the holistic chain. How do you retain customers in 2015? How will you have better usability in 2015? What do you have to know about SEO, PPC, and PLA, which includes Google Shopping for 2015? So we'll start off with the holiday recap. We did a webinar with, with Google and give a lot of advice. And we best summarize that advice as commit to the entire calendar. There were lots of really good key days that were um, prime shopping days that were about to happen in 2014 that we suggested people be prepared for. We said to get more aggressive with spend, especially during those days. Utilize all your available formats. That includes call out extensions, review extensions, Increase Google Shopping as a percentage of what you spend in ad spend, and target higher positions. That means when you have a text ad, try to aim for the top spot. Now we followed our own advice, and year over year, taking uh, November 15th to December 25th, year over year, our smallest spenders, our smallest clients that spend under 10K per month, they saw a nice increase in profit, 62%. For growing spenders between 10 and 20, they saw a 77% increase in profit. Our mature spenders saw a 63% increase in profit. But it was really those dominant spenders, the ones that spend uh, 50K plus per month, that saw the best results. And this is a nice introduction to one of the most important points of preparing for 2015. It's time to start believing in the power of economics. Our clients that are invested in more activity happening at the same time and bigger selection, the two components that we boil into believing in the power of economics. They're the ones that are seeing the best results. We're going to definitely go into a lot of detail on that, but this is a key takeaway. Now let's do a quick recap of what you should have been doing in 2014, as was advised by our 2014 webinars. And at any point in this webinar, if you see this symbol up here and it says something like SEO audit or interested in Facebook remarketing, just write to sales at exclusiveconcepts.com. It's not much easier than that. And let us know that this, uh, this point of action that was mentioned in the webinar is something you're interested in. So here's an example, SEO audit. So. In 2014, we spoke quite a bit about addressing duplicate content issues. And we recommend that the way you approach this is to first audit the issue. And auditing the issue for duplicate content is randomly taking three product pages and three category pages, taking all of the paragraph from that page, copying it and pasting it into Google, and see whether or not there's duplication issues. There could be lots of different types of duplication issues, but that's where you start. If you have a lot of duplicate content, you want to start focusing on consolidation schemes, meaning that say you have 100,000 pages and you now need to rewrite all your pages, you want to figure out ways to consolidate it. Maybe you have 20 pages that are the same product just by one variation. They've been differentiated by maybe color so you created 20 pages instead of one with the drop down. You want to think about how to consolidate it down to one page and then rewrite that content. So as a precursor to rewriting content, you want to think about how small can I make my target list? Same thing goes for Panda. First, you want to check all the 50 plus Panda updates against days that you may have seen drops in your traffic. If you ask us for an SEO audit, you write to sales at exclusive, we'll actually take all of your organic traffic by day and map it against the updates and see if you had a two week before and after drop on any one of the panned update days. If you dropped during one of those panned update days, we know that you were targeted by Panda. Then we start thinking about, well, what do we need to fix? Part of it is the quality of content. So we want to audit that. Is it comprehensive? Is it natural? But we also want to see whether or not, once again, you have too many pages being put into Google's index. That's what we call panda inflation. If you have 
over 2,000 pages, you are likely to get some kind of panda inflation issue. But when you're talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of pages in Google's index, that's where you really have a panda inflation issue. Then we have to figure out how to rewrite content. For Penguin issues, again, you want to see all of Penguin's updates against days that you had traffic drops. You want to study the optimization levels of your pages. So are there a, are, if you take a sample page, is the keyword density around one keyword too high and the keyword density for the other keywords too low? Is there a balance issue? Because that's what Panda's trying to, uh, Penguin's trying to target. That's over-optimization, it's SEO tactics that were gaming the system and doing really well until Penguin came out. You also want to see whether or not you have backlink issues. Specifically, if you have too many backlinks with the same keyword targeting one page so that you could rank for that keyword. That was a, a technique that worked really well until around 2011. So you want to audit that. And again, if you ask for an SEO audit, we'll do all this. It's actually no cost for us to do that. We'll see whether or not you have these issues. So sales at exclusiveconcepts.com, real simple. We'd love to talk to you. And then if you have Penguin issues, you want to rewrite the content as well uh, to mitigate the ramifications of having over-optimization. Then on the PPC side, we laid the foundation for making sure everyone in online retail really focused on profit-oriented management. So the first thing we did, um, or we recommend that you do as well, is make sure that you have native AdWords revenue tracking set up correctly in AdWords. And unfortunately, still the majority of people that I speak with that are not clients don't have that set up right. They think they do, they're told that they do, Sometimes they're double counting revenue with analytics and AdWords counting at the same time. Sometimes they just have conversion tracking, but not revenue. And someone said that it's impossible to do it on their e-commerce platform. It's just because they don't know what they're doing. It's important to get on that page. But revenue is not good enough. What you want to start doing after you track revenue properly is make sure you start computing your actions and your high-level performance using cash impact. That's a exclusive concepts term. It's an exclusive concepts, exclusive concept. Um, cash impact is the revenue generated from AdWords multiplied by your margins minus your ad spend and your management fee. We try to measure is this investment that you have in AdWords, is it adding any dollars to your bank account or is it just bleeding your bank account dry? It happens pretty often that I'll speak with people who have 20,000 and 50,000 plus ad spend and they're actually losing money. They're fulfilling thousands of orders every month, but they're losing money. So that's something to get on the right page with. And then you want to start implementing profit-oriented reporting. The sooner you do that, the sooner you'll be able to break even and start doing the right things towards the right goal. Trimming the fat. We talked a lot about this in 2014. How do you make sure that if you're spending on a thousand very different activities in pay-per-click, they can identify the 200 or 400 of them that are actually losing you money and the 100 of them that are making you lots of money. So what you want to do is you want to look at things from different angles. The native angles are really simple. By campaign, by keyword, by ad group, by ad, by dimensions like geo, by day parting. You can see what trends are working, what trends are not. And then we've built a lot of technologies that allow us to go much further than what is native to AdWords. If people are asking for a PPC audit, if you write to sales at Exclusive Concepts, you want us to do that audit, we're gonna do quite a few techniques that has never happened on your site before that will identify um, efficiencies and inefficiencies that can be acted upon immediately. But what you wanna do is, whatever angles are available to you right now, you wanna identify where there's efficiency and inefficiency, Cut out areas that have failed and double down on areas that are actually working, especially the ones that are working really well. You want to also commit to higher positions. This is counterintuitive uh, in the PPC world. A lot of times people will say, if an ad's not doing well, bid it down so that it takes a lower position. It's not the way it should work. 
Typically, what you want to do is work on getting that ad to take a higher position. If you do it the right way, then you will actually pay less per click at the top spot, have a higher click through rate, and you'll get the instant buyers. Instant buyers are people that are ready to buy right now. And if you can take the top spot, you're going to get them to your site and they're going to buy. And they will constitute a healthy portion of your overall conversion rate at position one. So first you want to see how much of your ad spend is actually going towards position one. Check out your quality scores and start utilizing the settings, especially formats, to improve quality scores. Because you want to take that top position, but not on the back of higher bids necessarily. You first want to address your format usage. That's call extension, call out extension, review extension, and site links. And then the relevance of your ads. Are the keywords in the ad, are the landing pages the right uh, landing pages for those keywords? Now, those are easy things to follow, kind of. Um, but if you followed us in 2014, you're already doing it. And if you allowed us to do it for you, even better. Uh, this year, our PPC clients saw a year-over-year profit increase of 900%. So 12 months versus 12 months. So 10 times more profit these past 12 months versus the 12 months earlier. We couldn't be happier. And SEO clients that allowed us to rewrite content for them that addressed their panda and penguin issues and duplicate content issues. Um, not a single one of our clients that is on that program was hurt by the major panda update that happened this past year. So good stuff if you follow the right philosophies. So that's the real takeaway. If you have the right approach, you can achieve the best results. Now, let's get into trends. Trends are from us analyzing our top 12 most successful clients going into 2015, they are the most successful. We wanted to think beyond the fact that they make money as a unifying factor, what is deeper under this skin that allows them to do well and allows us to do super well for them? So there's five things. One, they all believe in the power of economics. Okay, we mentioned this earlier. Larger inventory means more winning products. What does that mean? Let's say you have a thousand products. We're probably going to find 15 or so super winner products out of those thousand. Give us 10,000, now we have 150. 100,000, now we have 1,500 products to work with that are super winners that we could just go crazy with on SEO optimization, Google Shopping elevation, PPC text ads, targeting them through email, elevating them in the user experience. The more you have as winners, the more we can replicate that throughout your entire business. Large ad spends means more data, means more changes. Every time you're trying to track a trend, you want about 200 visits to validate that trend so you can make a decision. If you only spend enough to make those trends happen every so often, then you're only gonna see that much change. But if 200 click trends are happening constantly, then they are validating changes that we can make that transform the scope of your efficiency. So keep in mind, when you do spend a lot, yes, it's a burden at first, but you will accelerate your profit growth faster than if you allow things to go slow and data collection is slow. And keep in mind, our most successful clients are not shy to go out there and get funding. Um, in the past year, in the tech sector for venture capitalists, the number one tech investment was e-commerce. Moreover, Ken Estridge, who's our, our business mentor on our side, he helps um, us figure out our plans and helps us grow. Ken went to a recent conference where the main point of discussion that was so different in 2014 than any other time before was everyone agreed 
that the cost of debt is nearly free because interest rates are so low right now. You can basically, basically get money from a bank as if it was coming out of your own pocket because the interest rates are basically zero. If you have a good idea and a good business plan, you've never had access to capital like you have right now. So take advantage of that. If you really want to be the number one in your marketplace, you can actually get the capital that your number one competitor has right now in your pocket to compete. Our clients that are doing the best never think that any channel, any investment is their last chance to make that investment work, especially on the SEO side. A lot of people say, I was so hurt by Panda, so hurt by Penguin. I'll try to do a little bit of SEO, but if it doesn't work, last time I ever tried. No, you should really go for it. Everything can turn around, especially when you look at what's happened for our clients. We've taken, you know, lost causes left and right, and with enough time and persistence, turn them into wins again. So anytime you have a profit center, SEO, Google Shopping, email, even if you failed in the past, you want to rebuild from ground zero. And accept the fact that every profit center will always experience loss at first. So even if you've experienced it in the past, maybe you had a bad PPC team, and now you're going to switch to us. Consider this the first time you're investing, because you have to think that way. And the more profit centers you have, the stronger your business is. If you are a business that stands on one leg of SEO, or one leg of PPC, it doesn't take a lot to destroy the, the strength and uh, essentially the, the confidence you can have in your business from day to day. Just one quick change can, can interrupt that. I talked to businesses that woke up on February 22nd, 2011, Panda 1 that lost 60 to 90% of their business because that's all they did, SEO. They said, my business is thriving on SEO. I don't need to do anything else. Well, now they are. They're doing different things. That goes to the next point. Diversify and stay super realistic. Remember that every investment, every profit center has a unique timetable and a unique risk to it. Too much in one investment is lopsided as we just talked about. What you want to do is mix short-term easy winners with long-term ringers that over time are really going to do very well for you. You want to continue to diversify throughout 2015. You should come out the end of 2015 with many more channels that you are investing in in their success than when you started. We've noticed that our clients that are most successful are the ones that treat us with the most love. Really. They cherish their agency partnership. They treat us as their own team and they take a lot of pride in the team it means they show up to meetings it means they understand failure and successes are part of the game it means they treat us the way they would treat their own employees or themselves and finally holistic marketing is my backbone clients that are focusing on attaining more and more attracting more and more browsers into their site, converting more of that traffic into customers, and retaining more of those customers for life. Those are the ones that are doing the best. If they're just trying to attract a lot of visitors, but they're not focused on the user experience or email marketing, they failed. Their funnel fails. And we're going to talk about why. But the takeaway here is, in 2015, prepare to think bigger and act bigger. But you will get bigger if you do. So we asked the entire group at this point that was watching this webinar, what of these five strengths that you should be thinking about are actually your strongest? And this was the spread. 29% of people said, I never think something's my last chance. That's very helpful. I diversify and stay realistic. Then I believe in the power of economics. Then my agency is my team and I love them. But the one that really suffered was holistic marketing is my backbone. Too many people 
we're focused maybe just on search, but not user experience or remarketing. Then we said, okay, well, which of those five is your true weakness? And again, the same group said holistic marketing is the main weakness, 51%. Then I should embrace the power of economics more, very strong. I don't diversify, it can be unrealistic. I don't treat my agency as my own team. And no one said that they think that every, anything is their last chance. And that was fantastic. So since holistic marketing was the greatest weakness, and we stipulated it would be as well, the next section is actually about holistic remarketing, or holistic marketing, rather. And holistic marketing, there was a question at this time, what does it mean? This is what it means. It means focusing on attracting the right visitor to your site and investing in converting visitors at a higher rate over time and investing in retaining your customers over their lifetime. So how does the math on that work? It all comes back to cost per acquisition. Let's say you have all of this search traffic available to you, okay? This is the funnel of search traffic. There's lots of people typing in general terms. It's a huge search volume. But to target those general terms, you would have to have an acceptable cost per acquisition of $30 because those general terms have higher cost per click, plus they don't convert at the same rate. But if you target only long tail, where people are really ready to buy, they're, ty they're typing in like the make and model of a product, cost per click's low, conversion rates are high because people are ready to buy, you could say, I could target this with a $5 CPA. So given that that spread exists, say right now you're at the point where because of your conversion rate and your lifetime value of your customers, the only thing that you can say is, at most, I can accept cost per acquisition as high as $12. That means you could target the long tail up to a little bit of the mid tail, but your competitors have to dominate here because they might be able to accept a higher cost per acquisition. So then we said, let's theoretically say, if you started the year with the cost per acquisition of $12, and by the end of 2015, your conversion rate increased by 50%, and you started remarketing to your past visitors, and your lifetime value went up by 50% as well, then what's your new acceptable cost per acquisition? We allowed people to take some time to do the math, and this is what we got. 36% of people thought it was $19. Because it seems like it's impossible to go from $12 to the actual number, which is $27, by just having a 50% increase in conversion rate and a 50% increase in lifetime value. But that's actually the new cost per acquisition. How to calculate that? It's 12 times 1.5 for the first 50% boost times 1.5 for the second 50% boost. And now, with a new cost per acquisition that is acceptable near the top, you can dominate your marketplace. It's actually that simple. If you avoid focusing on lifetime value and user experience, then you have to stay at the bottom of, or the tail end of your market's universe. So, next time, you look at your top competitor and say, what's their secret? How can they spend so much that they're always ranking number one in PPC for our most general terms? It's because they've invested in holistic marketing. And if you want to get to that same point, you need to start thinking about that as well. Okay, so let's begin at the end of the attract, convert, retain chain that is holistic marketing. How can you increase the lifetime value of someone that you just closed today, for example, as a new customer. How do you get them to buy from you twice, three times, five times? So that's a big question. And we're gonna explore three different uh, particular channels that we think are going to be strong, continue to be strong in 2015, if not some improvements that would lead to even better performance this year than what you've been used to in the past. So email, social, and remarketing. Let's talk about email first. 
There's two main ways to approach email. One is what most people do, I would say. It's campaign centric. What you do is you take your entire blast list and you send out something to everyone. So you get a high volume of recipients. You do a high frequency of sends, not a lot of segmentation, but you try to do a lot of testing to make sure you understand how people are responding. There are a lot of pros to that. The platform requirements for this are incredibly slim. You could get an ESP for one-tenth, one-twentieth the cost of a more advanced strategy. You can pay more attention to each campaign. So if you know something is going out to everyone, you might want to spend two, three, five, ten hours putting together the full campaign. It doesn't take a lot of effort. And because you're sending out one message to everyone, you can synchronize the look and feel of your website to match that single message. Cons are that when you do something that's campaign centric, you're always going to alienate some people because you're not targeting people specifically. You might just be targeting 70% of them in general and the other 30% that are slightly outside of that target group are not interested. And it doesn't treat your ideal customer, your best customer, the one that can spend 10 times as much as another in any different particular way. Customer centric is kind of the opposite. What you do here is you are much more segmented. You still send high frequency, if not higher frequency, because you anticipate that people are more likely to like what you're sending them. And you customize it with targeted recommendations. It's based on the behavior of the person who is receiving this email. The pros are you can basically set a lifetime value goal for your entire business and say, I'm going to achieve this and continue to measure the per customer LTV and work on that customer centric approach. You can send more relevant emails per recipient. There's none that are coming their way that are not important to them. And you can automate a lot of this experience through triggered emails, etc. The cons are it's a little more effort and typically the platform requirements are a little bit higher. I can't say that either one is better than the other. These pros and cons even them out in many different ways. The costs um, are usually proportionate to their gain though. So if you are uh, doing the campaign centric approach, it's probably time that you start incorporating more of the customer centric approach and vice versa. But for everybody, um, one of the few things that we've tested over the years on our conversion testing side that has helped more people in their email marketing than anything else that we've tested is a widget that pops up and tries to get more people to sign up to your newsletter even if they don't make a purchase. And we've um, turned this into a product on conversionsondemand.com, a com an exclusive concepts company. And you can try a free trial right now for 30 days and it sets up real easy. So you can just have this pop up and essentially get people to sign up. Here's a quick case study of a company called Historical Clothing Realm. 1.26% of their visitors from July to October signed up through this widget, probably around the same as their conversion rate. The good thing is 9.5% of those people who signed up eventually converted. So it was a great way to get people who would otherwise not convert to finally convert and put them into your sphere of influence. Social media, over the years people have asked us to do more on the social media side. We've indulged with ad hoc programs, but it wasn't until recent that we realized there was an inherently dwarfed nature of impact when it comes to social and that there is a workaround. So why does social media typically not work? This is the case. Let's say you get 100 visitors to your site. It's likely you'll get maybe one Facebook follower, which is actually pretty good. Then you have 100 followers on Facebook. Say you post something to them. Typically, only a small portion of your followers will actually see what you've posted. Only your strongest evangelists. If they think the content's good enough, then it goes to a wider group, then a wider group, then a wider group, then finally to everyone that follows you. 
So it's not guaranteed that everyone's going to see that. So you have to work really hard to get a post to actually translate into visibility of 100% of your followers, which is 1% of your visitors to your site. So in that case, this challenge is almost like a 10,000 to 1 issue. Out of every 10,000 visitors to your site, 100 times 100, one person will see a post. Doesn't seem like good odds in terms of capitalizing on social. What we suggest is to do Facebook remarketing. With Facebook remarketing, everyone who comes to your site can see any post that you put. But even more so, you can set it up in an automated way so that the posts are dynamic. And what people are seeing in their Facebook uh, feed now that they've been to your site is in between updates from their friends, the product that they were looking at on your website. So it's dynamic. It's very relevant. And one of the genius things that comes out of Facebook retargeting is if someone signed up on their phone to Facebook and they're signed in to their PC to Facebook and there's interactivity, this remarketing will actually connect the two dots. It's one of the rare examples of a company figuring out how to do cross-device monitoring and attribution. So it is a step in the future that's the most all-encompassing way to do your social media. Now, AdWords remarketing is also a very powerful way for you to not only build your brand amongst your perfect audience, but close more deals and create what we call a forever net. And these three goals are done through three different parts of Google's AdWords remarketing. The classic remarketing, which we call basic, is when someone comes to your site, they buy something, and then as they go through Google's display network, they're gonna see ads for your brand. That's a good way for you to continue to build brand with your perfect target audience. So that's actually very good. It doesn't always turn into revenue, but it does help build your brand with your ideal audience. Through dynamic remarketing, what you can do is target people who came to your site, abandoned cart with a product in it. Then, just like with Facebook remarketing, they will start to see your products show up in ads all around Google's display network. So people aren't getting fascinated with your brand. They're not obsessing over this logo that you have up in the top left corner when they're on your website. What you expect your visitors to do is to create a fascination around products that you're selling, some emotional connection with it. So now when they see that product show up in Google's display network, that emotional connection comes back. If you just showed them images of your brand, they'll probably forget it. But dynamic remarketing is really good about getting people's emotional responses back, plus reminding them of what they're supposed to buy when they come back to your site. RLSA is remarketing lists. So you create a remarketing list based on, you know, uh, last 30 days, people came to my site. That's a list. It's created through AdWords. So that's RL of RLSA. For search ads, that's the SA. What does this mean? That means someone's come to your site in the last 30 days, and now they're typing in a keyword that is relevant to your products. You can target them for cheaper because you've proven to Google that there's a high likelihood they'll click on your ad based on the user's data. So if you extend that to 540 days, which is how long you can extend the remarketing cookie, you can essentially create a forever net. Anytime in the future, when someone has been to your site, types in something relevant to your site, you can show up very prominent for, for them for a lower cost because your quality score is higher. It's a lower, you have a higher ad rank score. Hopefully that makes sense. We explain this in much greater detail in 2014. So the takeaway here is Lifetime value building just got a lot easier. Remarketing is at a new level of, of dynamicism. So is remarketing through social. And on the email side, finding a blend between campaign and customer-centric 
is probably where you want to go. Now usability. How do you get more people to convert into those customers that you will then target to become big lifetime customers? So usability, we're not going to go into a lot of detail here, but we need to make a very clear case. There are a few rules that if you fall into a particular segment, you absolutely should be investing in conversion testing right now. For starters, if you spend more than 20000 per month in paid search, then you really should be investing in conversion testing. And what we suggest is to redistribute 2K of that spend towards conversion testing. Don't increase your budgets. Absorb this. So for example, if you spend 40K a month, redistribute 2K to testing. If you achieve a 20% increase in conversion rate, which you will eventually, if not sooner, you'll get a 14% increase in revenue with no increase in costs. So this redistribution can be huge. Plus, it'll help all your other channels as well. Or if you have over 100,000 visits per month, over 150,000, sorry, 150,000 visits per month. Example, if you have 250K visits per month, you spend 2,000 on testing. If you go from a 2.5% conversion rate to 2.75, just an incremental 0.25%, that's an extra 625 orders at an incremental cost of only $3.20 each. So the financial case is absolutely there. So if you're thinking about, is it my time to start testing? Well, if you've been able to bring your spend up to 20K or your traffic up to 150K, then 100% yes. And not testing is the equivalent of wasting money. If you don't figure out how to increase your acceptable cost per acquisition through testing, you're always gonna have constraints on how big you can go in your marketplace. Now, what's really gonna happen in the next year is a lot of people are gonna focus less on the PC usability of their site and more on the mobile usability. That's part of the nut that is uncracked. So Google did a really nice job this past year of working with a lot of different stores to compile the top 25 rules for mobile usability. I went through and I chose the 12 that I thought were the most relevant to most of the people that will be watching this presentation. Keep menus short and sweet. Very simple. Make sure calls to action are front and center. People have to see that at the cart easily. Make sure it's not difficult to get back to the home page, which it can be for a lot of sites. If you take a slightly graphical approach, make sure you're not giving too much to promotions. Sounds counterintuitive, but Google found that that, that actually has better results. Make the site search incredibly visible. This is how people tap into hundreds of thousands of products on your site. Make sure that the site results are actually relevant when people type in your keywords. And my recommendation here is take the top 10 or 20 keywords that people type into site search and every week test them. Make sure what is showing up is what you want to have show up. Implement filters to improve site search usability. That's incredibly important on PC as well. Let users purchase as a guest, also important on PC, but more important when it comes to mobile, where people want a streamlined, quick, convenient shopping experience. Make it easy to finish converting on another device. Back in the day, people used to always have email me this product so that they can complete their order at a later time on PC usage. Doing that on mobile makes even more sense. I like the product, email it to me, next day they will show up at work, it's in their inbox, they buy on PC. It's a great way to connect the dots. And make sure your entire site is optimized for mobile. One of the things that Google says was most bothersome was those sites where all of a sudden you would stumble on a page that was full site. You had no idea how to get back. Don't make people have to pinch to Zoom. Actually give them enablements to Zoom. 
they want to see those products clear, do something like this. Make sure those products are expandable. They recommended this, particularly, as a really good example. Tap twice to zoom swipe to view more images. So clear instructions. Remember that with the gamification and the finger touch technology that people are used to on their mobile phones, giving them clear instructions but having them do actions is perfectly a good thing to do. And the takeaway here is if you want mobile results, better PPC performance, better SEO results on mobile, you have to start with your mobile site first. Okay, now let's move on to the search side. SEO, PPC, and PLA. And we'll start with SEO. We've talked a lot about how content is important. Through 2014, we explained to people how content overlaps with duplicate content issues, Panda and Penguin, and we recapped that already. But there is actually more that happens with SEO. And our clients that have been on with us know that while content fuels their growth, we always have to be cognizant of these other aspects. So what are they? Content quality, that's mostly Panda. Relevance, that's optimization for keywords, but also potential over-optimization with Panda, with Penguin. Backlink authority, domain popularity, and technical. So to understand how important it is to know these different buckets, we go back to 2011. In 2011, Larry Page came back as CEO at Google. When he came back, there were all these loopholes that he created 10 years earlier when he was CEO um, in terms of backlink and optimization levels that would allow people to rank well for keywords. Most, most of it was because uh, he created PageRank, named after himself Larry PageRank, which was create a backlink for a certain term to a page and you'll rank well for that term. Well, these turn out to be loopholes. The SEO community, uh, we exploited it. And when he came back 10 years later, he basically found ways to close all those loopholes. The reason we bring this up again is you need to think about the dramatic impact that can come from a little bit of executive switchover at Google. Because in 2015, the guy who's been running search quality seems to be on hiatus, might even be gone permanently. He doesn't seem to think he needs to come back. He's been giving people updates. Over the past three years, under his oversight, he made sure that the Panda and Penguin algorithm updates helped change the quality of results actually showing up, okay? So what's gonna happen? Well, Panda and Penguin are really good implementations against um, low quality content or over-optimized content. So we don't think that it's likely that a new layer that is gonna have some kind of stringent rule on content is going to emerge in Matt Cutts' absence. Instead, we think that the parameters around Penguin and Panda are just going to get a little tighter, continuously get a little tighter. Meaning, if your quality used to be like this, and then Panda said you need to be this high, and you got up to that point, you need to start writing content that is this good, because Panda's quality standards gonna keep increasing. Now what's up here? AP style, Associated Press Guidelines. For our clients, we have over 20 content writers. They only write AP style content for all of our clients, for every page of content we write for our clients. That's keeping the highest standard. So start implementing the highest standard. So as Panda standard continues to increase, they are already way beyond it. When it comes to Panda, you have to keep revitalizing what it means to have natural levels of optimization. With the goal of implementing content that is natural enough for what might be implemented in 2018. Other than that, no major changes. So what this says to us is, as long as you're investing in the right type of content, and we're the only, we can only vouch for our type of content, if you invest in that, you can do more investment in it 
with greater certainty and less risk in the coming years. The rest of what we think Google is actually going to focus on is technical. The remainder of Matt Cutts' team. We think they're going to focus more on the technical aspects, crawling errors, indexation issues, etc. So what you want to do is make sure that at no point are you overlooking this. No crawling errors, no duplication errors. You want to shrink the indexation of shallow content and shrink the indexation of duplicate pages. So if you're focusing on content, make sure you don't forget those aspects. Now, if you're going to be able to go from 60 to 100 miles per hour uh, with your SEO, what are you going to have to aim for for it to make sense? For our clients, we started creating two new models. One model is what we call relative organic visibility. We'll take a client and see all the keywords they rank for and their top competitors. Some overlap will exist. But as we study what the competitors are trying to rank for that you just don't have relevance for because it hasn't been optimized yet, over time, that creates a list of other keywords to explore. And as you optimize for those keywords, you then own the entire sphere for all of your competitors. That's one way to look at things, to set your goals, and to achieve something pretty big in your marketplace. Another way to look at things, and we've implemented this even through the SEO audit. If you write to Sales at Exclusive Concepts and ask for the SEO audit, we can already test for this where you are in a benchmark. This part as well. This is the keyword universe ownership. Say you're trying to rank for the keyword universe of home decor, meaning the term home decor and all of its permutations. What we want to do is find out how many keywords you rank for right now, 540 or 450. The average rank amongst those, 34.5, fantastic. And how many keywords are between ranking number five and number 15? That's what we call striking distance. So we monitor that. And over time, we optimize for more keywords and better for the keywords that we were already starting to show up for. And that starts creating real trends. 450 keywords to 650 to 1020. Average ranking on the fourth page to the third page to the second page. Average. In terms of striking distance keywords, more and more of them between 5 and 15. This is how you should be looking at your potential. So takeaway time is, after years of being skeptics, we believe that right now is a new window for online retailers to start dominating SEO again. Okay, let's move on to PPC, something that we've talked about a lot in 2014. One thing that we introduced people to is called the flux approach. And we want to redefine exactly what this is. If you have a PPC team that is not doing something right now, doesn't have a proactive plan right now, that's not good for you. What we've done is created a philosophy that ensures that every account is in some state of proactive management at any time. So we believe every account should be in a single state of proactive management. And there's two states. State one is built. Here's your account and what you've invested in. And then here's an investment opportunity at AdWords, a function of AdWords or a new strategy, new category to target, new language to target, new country to target. It's a new investment. We build from what you have into something experimental. You increase your spend towards that R&D. And then the trim function is taking everything that you invest in and looking from every angle to see where you can have efficiencies versus inefficiencies. Cut the inefficiencies, double down on where it's efficient. Then invest in something new, then trim. Build, trim, build, trim. That's the flux approach. Keep going back and forth. Now the mega flux approach is for higher spenders. When you spend more, one single account can be in multiple states of build and multiple states of trim all at the same time because 
the data and the inventory are allowing for new opportunities at a much faster pace. Which is why when we started this, we looked at those clients that are spending 50,000 plus per month, their year over year increase in profit was accelerated dramatically. Three to four times that of all the groups below them. Because you're able to test more, trim more, create more efficiencies. That's why Walmart works. If you have to think about it on that level. But sometimes when you think about those big brands, it makes you feel like that's not achievable. Um, but it is achievable in your size of a business if you accept uh, and start to believe in the power of, uh, of the economies. Okay, so figuring out your max spend. People will often ask, I know how much I spend right now, how much can I spend? And what has emerged as a calculation that makes a lot of sense is to take your top competitor's revenue, divide it by your revenue, and that becomes X. So let's say you currently do 5 million, your top competitor does 50, X is 10. Multiply X against your current ad spend, and that's your new max ad spend. So if you were spending 8,000 a month, and your top competitor is 10 times your size in terms of revenue, the max spend you could imagine is 80K. We asked everyone who was watching this presentation to go ahead and calculate X for their business. The, the largest group was saying that their competitor is six to 10 times their size. The second largest group said, we're basically the biggest, but our competitors may have a little bit more of an edge. Then the rest are definitely smaller and they need to think about getting funding. But the good thing is, if you are using the flux approach and you're not just ramping up your spend, but as you're ramping it up, you're going back and forth to trim out the fat and then build up more, trim out the fat, build up more. To grow 10 times doesn't require 10 times increase in spend. It, inc it requires a fraction of that because whatever efficiency you have right now may double or quadruple over time. So if it doubles, you only need to increase by five times. If it quadruples, you only need to increase by two and a half times. But the takeaway is your budget will control your growth rates. And for those of you that know your top competitors spend a lot more, we can't just say that there's this huge gap between who you are and who they are that does not allow you to act the way they act. You have at your resource, venture cap, angel investors, banks that will help you with a good business model invest in something that will create growth, especially in the e-commerce world. In PPC, as we start evolving the PPC approach, we're gonna start seeing a few new things emerge. One is better targeting. So an example of this is right now in AdWords, you can go to settings, campaign, location, advanced location groups. And say you wanna target highest income groups in New York State. You could select New York State and say I only want to target the top 10% earners by zip code. So only the zip codes that have the highest earning potential will now be targeted. Everyone else will be excluded. You could do the inverse as well if you're not targeting a luxury market. If you like to have people go to Best Buy and search for products and you sell them for a better price, you might want to target shopping areas. If you target college students, you might want to target universities. All of these have been enabled now in Google. And the same concept works for Google Shopping. Also in 2015, so that's one thing that Google is doing that's really helping. Another thing Google is doing that is really helping, and this is a main prediction that we have for 2015, is that Google is gonna keep replicating functionality of the middlemen software companies 
like Marin, Kenshu, Channel Advisor, Wordstream, Clickable. Why? Three reasons. These technologies have a tough time keeping up with the changes AdWords is able to do. These technologies are cross cost prohibitive and only impact the minority of users, people uh, using AdWords. And these technologies deliver inconsistent performance impact. Some are better than others, and even the ones that are good don't impact everyone equally. So for an example of Google taking over what used to be only available to these middlemen software is dynamic ads with the with the uh, column uploads. So for example, say you created a dynamic ad that says one variable to choose from, save up to another variable on another variable. X to choose from, save up to Y percentage on product type. Then you would upload a lot of different products, a lot of different product types with their corresponding number of products, that's X, and the max discount. And you connect those two together without starting the business section of AdWords. And all of a sudden your dynamic ad, you can create a few different dynamic ads, are now going to play off of that, those columns of content. Really cool stuff. Google is also committing more to helping growing accounts explore what they can do and become more stable. So our team has um, a group of uh, four individuals at Google that focus on our accounts. So if we have a client that wants to expand their account geographically or horizontally or vertically, Google will help us to research to figure out whether or not it makes sense. If we know that we're not utilizing certain features of our marketing or YouTube or something else in the ad world, Google will see how big of an opportunity there is for that client, for any client, for us on our behalf. If a client sells as part of their catalog some sensitive products like adult or firearms, Google can create a product or program with us to make sure that anytime red flags are raised, we know that we can take some evasive action. And any feed issues that occur on the PLA side, Google can help us circumvent those um, by holding our hand through the process. So the takeaway is Google is making sure that if you're willing to invest more in PPC this year, that it's going to take you further than it ever has before. So great partner to have for us, great partner to have for you. Uh, Google is making sure that the online retail customers, this emerging market of customers, are going to buy from you with their help. So, huge takeaway. Now, PLAs. We're not going to talk too much about PLAs. We've talked a lot about it in 2014. There are just a few things that you should know are changing right now. We believe we're coming to the point where feed issues, you know, where feeds get suspended or products get suspended, that's starting to come to an end. One reason is Google is giving us tons of support to make sure that they can hold our hands through any problems. There's a new warning systems. You know, we got an email from Google in 2014 that said, thank you guys for making the case. We are changing the suspension period for people who are um, going to get suspended and they need a little bit of time to correct feed issues from 24 to 48 hours to two weeks. So that anyone who's about to get suspended has more time to address their issues. And that's because we pushed really hard for them to do that in our visits back and forth with Google. So that was really nice. Um, and then they just released a diagnostics tool. It's pretty brand new. We'll show you what that's going to do for you. In the diagnostics tool, you can see all the different statuses of products in your feed over 30 days and how they're changing. If you have issues, you can fix those issues and you can see immediately that things that are awaiting review or disapproved are now active. You can see your color quadrants start to change. So there's four different status options that you can get with all your product IDs. Disapproved, awaiting review, expiring, that's probably because you haven't updated your feed recently, or active, which is good. And 
for any issues that have come about. Google gives you the entire list of the issues that are existing. And in some cases, you can click in and actually expand and see exactly what IDs are corresponding to that issue. We didn't have that type of transparency in the past. It's, it's pretty big for us. Now, a lot of people are still investing in Google Shopping on their own and not managing it through a proactive management team like ours. So I want to give you 10 reasons, 10 things you should be doing in Google Shopping that you're probably not doing that our, our management team would be doing for you. One, we'd be helping you figure out how to add more products. The more products you have, the more wins you have. We'll make sure that we can refresh your best sellers group that is relevant to this last month so that we can map it to best sellers campaigns. If they are the best sellers, they should show up more often when you're trying to target your customers out there in Google Shopping. It'll create more efficiency. Analyze buying habits. You should be checking for all your groups. Do people like to buy in daytime, nighttime, weekday, weekend? And it might be different from one product group to another. And you can change your bids accordingly. If you know that some products are better in some season than another, you should be mapping that to your infrastructure and making changes accordingly. Targeting bigger keywords. Google says you can't target keywords in Google Shopping. We disagree. There are ways to target bigger keywords. You can choose a product that is a top seller, optimize the feed for that keyword, bid up, take all your other products, and create a negative for that keyword. That's pretty much how you do it. No downtime with sensitive products. If you have any sensitive products, that is something that we should coordinate with Google in advance to make sure that you have no problems. If you know you target men versus women or youth versus adult, breaking that into the structure of your campaigns on the Google Shopping side will help you choose who you want to target better. It can make a huge difference, especially when you're mapping it back to geo and time of day, etc. Scale devices as you improve them. Are you planning on creating a responsive design? As soon as you arrive with it, you should unlock mobile multipliers that are set to zero. Optimize towards per visit value. In the dimensions tab, you can sort by ID or view your IDs, your product IDs, and create a new column for per visit value. And every day, you should be figuring out where you need to pull back because per visit value is too low, where you should invest more because per visit value is high. Sometimes trends in Google Shopping are really short term, so you have to capture them in a short period of time. And finding your winning categories. Using dimensional analysis in um, Google Shopping right now, you can actually start figuring out what categories are worth more to you than others. It changes your ability to invest efficiently across the board. And the takeaway is, if you are still managing Google Shopping through a cited and forget it approach, you're definitely doing it wrong. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that people have on the Google Shopping side is, they say, if I increase my um, cost per click, not my budget, then all of a sudden the traffic I used to get goes away and I get really bad traffic. Why is that? Well, here's a good concept. Long tail traffic might come in at 40 cents cost per click. Pretty quick conversion rate because people are at the tail end of their shopping experience. Mid tail might have more search volume but a higher cost per click and the conversion rate is not instant. Some of it's latent and even more so for general terms where the vast majority of the market is higher cost per click not instant conversion rates, you need to have really strong remarketing to close those visits. Well, if you just had $1,000, you invested it all at a cost per click of 40 cents, you would only get this long tail traffic. 2,500 clicks, 100 orders, $10 cost per acquisition. If you opt your cost per click to 60 cents, Google will say, 
okay, we'll just give you mid tail from now on. We'll burn the budget on that, and then won't give you any long tail. 2,000 clicks, less orders, higher cost per acquisition. Budget didn't change. All the changes, less orders, less efficiency. Same budget, higher cost per click, just general, and you get even worse. Half the clicks, half the orders, and double the cost per acquisition versus long tail. That's what happens when all you're doing is changing your cost per click and not your budget. But you can get around this by creating tiers. Tiers for your long tail to make sure that you still get all that long tail traffic. Another tier for your mid tail with a larger budget and a much larger budget for your general, but not allowing your budget to get burnt by any of these so it can actually go to the long tail. In this blended approach, you go from our original best case scenario, which was $1,000 to get 100 orders, to now 16,000 to get almost nine and a half times the number of orders. So yes, your cost per acquisition does go down, but you've basically taken over your market now. And how can you do that? You invest in usability, you invest in long and your lifetime value, increase that acceptable CPA, and all of a sudden, you go from being the smallest fish to the biggest fish. So scaling up PLA is actually a very careful science. With some new things that are happening on remarketing or in Google Shopping that are very noteworthy, one is that RLSA that we talked about before now includes shopping ads. So it looks just like a shopping ad, except it's targeting your past visitors, and for a lower price, you get even more prominent positions. We've tried it on over 60 clients, but 100% of them are seeing good results. Purgatory campaigns is a concept that we just created this past, the tail end of last year. It's working really well. You take products that have high search volume, but are otherwise not actually making profit, and you focus on the decisions that will make them profitable. You maintain a low bid, but you start carefully applying negatives, dimensional optimization, and subtle bid adjustments until it becomes profitable. Because you know you're sitting on an opportunity. Right now it's a weakness, but if you can make it work, it's a huge part of your market search volume. Outside of Google, the only other shopping uh, area that we think is worth looking into right now is Amazon. If you do shopping through Amazon, someone types in a keyword, you can actually show up at the top. When people click in, it looks like a regular um, Amazon post, but it says shop this website instead of add to cart. Or if someone clicks on um, see other prices, you know, it's like 21 new and used, um, as low as $10. Do you see that in Amazon? If someone clicks on it, what it does is it shows a list of products, many from other sites. And if your combined price and shipping is the lowest, you rank number one. That's the second way you can show up through Amazon PLA. The third way is when someone's looking at a product, just like other recommended products shows up as you scroll down in Amazon, there's another section that says product ads from external websites. It looks just the same as recommended products and it takes people to your site. Easy way to get Amazon to be your partner rather than your competitor. And we went ahead and asked everyone to tell us whether or not they've tried Amazon PLA and what the results are like. It was split. 12% is, are using it right now. Half of them say it's working well. Half of them say results are not great. So that's about where we stand on it as well. But most people have not used it yet. So there's a lot of opportunity for people to try it out. It's not very expensive. It's something that we do for our clients. So if you're writing the sales at exclusiveconcepts.com, make sure if you're interested, tell us you're interested in Amazon PLA as well. Okay, um, final takeaway is consider Amazon your next avenue of PLA. Quick recap, in terms of budgeting, plan to go bigger than ever before in 2015. That is how you will get bigger results. 
secure financing if you need seed money. Make sure you spread your investment from attract, convert, and retain holistically. And mix both short, short-term cash creating investments and long-term investments that will actually give you huge edge against your competitors in the, in the end. In terms of executing, work on securing a larger inventory, continue to find new vendors. I've been talking to people since the presentation that are creating hit lists of 100 vendors that they're gonna keep calling into throughout the year. On the retain side, build a mix of email, social, and remarketing. On the convert side, redistribute AdWords budget to conversion testing and optimize for mobile. For SEO, great time to invest in SEO. In terms of uh, PPC, make sure that you understand what your max spend can be and start escalating throughout 2015 towards it. In terms of Google Shopping, make sure that you expand your investment to include general, mid-tail, and long-tail. And if you want to, on the Amazon side, consider targeting Amazon as your partner through their Amazon PLA this year. That's it, folks. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nick Rajpal, VP of Client Services at Exclusive Concepts, sales at exclusiveconcepts.com. If you want to write to us, and Rajpal, N-R-A-J-P-A-L at exclusiveconcepts.com if you want to write directly to me. Thanks, folks. Take care. I hope you enjoyed it.